the eunuch and concubine. Kofi, a bright-eyed boy of 12, lay on a mat in the center of the dimly lit room, his small frame covered with a woven blanket. His mother, Na, sat beside him, her eyes reflecting the anguish that gripped her heart. Her husband, Kwame, stood nearby, trying to remain strong for the sake of his family. The royal decree had come down months ago, and it was inescapable. Kofi had been chosen as the village's tribute to the kingdom's royal court, selected for a future that would be far different from what any parent would dream for their child. In the hushed room, a village elder and a skilled healer prepared to perform the ritual that would irrevocably alter Kofi's life. Though they were tasked with the procedure, there was an air of solemnity in their movements, as if they too shared in the family's pain. The healer began his work, his hand steady but gentle. He whispered ancient prayers and blessings, invoking the spirits to watch over Kofi. Na clutched her son's hand, tears streaming down her face as she sang a lullaby that had comforted him since infancy. The procedure was a rite of passage that had been carried out for generations in the kingdom, marking the transition from boyhood to a life of servitude within the royal court. Though the physical pain was temporary, the emotional scars ran deep, for Kofi would never bear children or experience the love that most took for granted. As the ritual concluded, the room fell silent, save for Kofi's labored breaths and his mother's mournful song. The healer carefully bandaged the wound, his hands a mix of tenderness and expertise. Kwame approached his son, his eyes filled with a mixture of pride and sorrow. You are strong, my son, he whispered, his voice breaking. You will endure, and your spirit will shine even in the darkest of times. Kofi's journey had begun, a journey that would lead him far from the warmth of his family's embrace. The young boy had been marked by the kingdom, but he was determined to carve his own destiny, to rise above the trials that lay ahead, and to find purpose and love in the most unexpected of places. The Eunuchs Years passed, and Kofi grew accustomed to the routines of life within the towering walls of the royal court. The once young boy had matured into a poised young man, his eyes now reflecting a blend of curiosity and resilience. Within the towering walls of the royal court, the eunuchs existed as enigmatic shadows, trusted with the most delicate and intimate aspects of palace life. In the harem, they moved with an almost ethereal grace, their presence acknowledged but rarely noticed. To the outside world, they were like ghosts, silent and invisible, existing solely for the service of the king and his concubines. Yet, for all their importance, the eunuchs were often marginalized within the court. They faced discrimination and disdain from some members of the nobility who viewed them as less than human, their castration seen as a cruel reminder of their servitude. It was a stigma that clung to them like a shadow, a constant reminder of the sacrifice they had made for the kingdom. Amidst this complex world of politics, culture, and power dynamics, Kofi emerged as a figure of remarkable intrigue. He possessed a unique talent that set him apart from his fellow eunuchs. A talent for diplomacy, strategy, and a deep understanding of human nature. It was as though he had an innate ability to decipher the unspoken language of the court, to sense the tensions that simmered beneath the surface, and to calm the stormy seas of politics with a mere whisper. His uncanny skill earned him a reputation that transcended his status. He became known as the Whisperer within the palace, a title that spoke to his ability to mediate disputes, bridge divides, and resolve conflicts with finesse. The Harem in the heart of the royal palace, the harem stood as a world unto itself, a realm where time seemed to stand still. Opulent silks draped from the walls, and the scent of exotic perfumes lingered in the air. Within these luxurious chambers, the king's concubines moved with an air of grace and elegance, their laughter and whispered conversations creating an ethereal ambience. Yet, for the eunuchs who attended to them, the harem was a place of both enchantment and torment. They existed on the periphery, their presence acknowledged but not truly seen. To the concubines, they were mere vessels of service, beings without desire or ambition, stripped of their masculinity and humanity. For Kofi and his fellow eunuchs, the harem was a stark reminder of the life they could never lead. They watched as the concubines undressed without a second thought, their own bodies concealed beneath the modest robes of their station. It was a painful paradox, for while they were trusted with the most intimate moments of the palace's occupants, they remained distant, their own desires forever out of reach. Some of their brethren, unable to reconcile the reality of their existence, turned to mind-numbing substances to numb the ache in their souls. Yet, it was in the midst of this delicate dance between servitude and desire that Kofi's world shifted. One fateful day, a girl named Adana entered the harem. Her presence was unlike any other he had encountered. She moved with a grace and confidence that drew his attention, her eyes betraying a depth of knowledge. 
She possessed an acute understanding of medicine, and she offered her healing touch to fellow concubines, tending to their ailments with care and compassion. As days turned into weeks, Kofi and Adana formed a unique connection, their bond transcending the roles they were assigned. In her, he saw not just a concubine, but a woman destined for greatness. The Opportunity Four weeks, the palace had been shrouded in a pall of uncertainty and despair. The mighty king of the powerful African kingdom lay in his chamber, his once robust form now emaciated, ravaged by wounds sustained in battle. Despite the tireless efforts of the kingdom's finest physicians, his condition had only deteriorated. It seemed that even the most skilled healers were powerless in the face of the relentless grip of death. Kofi, with a weight of responsibility heavy on his shoulders, approached Adana in the hushed corridors of the palace. Adana, Kofi began, his voice barely above a whisper. The king's condition has worsened. Our best physicians have tried everything, but it seems he is slipping further away from us. Adana met Kofi's gaze with unwavering determination. I believe I can heal him, Kofi. I've seen wounds like his before, and I have knowledge of remedies that could make a difference. Kofi nodded. But his expression remained solemn. I knew you would say that, he replied, his voice tinged with a mixture of hope and caution. But you must understand, Adana, this is not just an opportunity to save the king. It is an opportunity that carries immense risk. The queen mother is at her wit's end, and if you fail, Adana's resolve remained unshaken. If I fail, I know the consequences, Kofi, she affirmed, her eyes reflecting unwavering determination. Kofi managed a small, sad smile, appreciating the strength of her spirit. Very well then, be prepared for the queen to call upon you. With those words hanging heavily in the air, Kofi disappeared into the labyrinthine corridors of the palace. A Mother's Desperation When Adana entered the Queen Mother's chamber, she was met with a sight that tugged at her heart. The Queen Mother, once a pillar of regal strength, appeared to have aged years in the span of weeks. Dark circles marred the delicate skin beneath her eyes, and her face was etched with the lines of countless sleepless nights. Adana approached the queen, prepared to give a carefully rehearsed speech about her plans to heal the king. However, before she could utter a word, the queen mother's eyes locked onto her, and in those haunted orbs, Adana saw a profound desperation. I do not wish to hear it, the queen mother said, her voice heavy with emotion. Kofi has told me all about you. Just make my son well again. That night, Adana entered the king's chambers, her heart heavy with the weight of her task. She found him lying in bed, his once mighty form reduced to a fragile figure. His face was drawn and pale, and his breathing was shallow and labored. Without a moment's hesitation, she set to work, her hands moving with practiced grace. Adana administered the herbal remedies she had brought with her, carefully measuring out each ingredient and mixing them together in a pot. She worked with a focused intensity, her mind attuned to the king's every need. The hours passed in a blur as she tended to him, monitoring his condition with unwavering dedication. Slowly but surely, the king's fever began to subside. His breathing became easier, and his color returned. Throughout the long night, Adana remained steadfast at his side, her touch gentle and reassuring, her expertise shining through with every action. As the first rays of the sun illuminated the palace, Adana looked upon her patient. The king was sitting up in bed, his eyes bright and clear, a spark of life rekindled within them. The Dance of Seduction Kofi breathed a sigh of relief when he heard that the king was on his way to recovery. He turned to Adana with a serious expression. Adana, he said, his voice low and intense, we need to kick the second part of our plan into high gear. You want to be queen, don't you? Adana met his gaze with determination. Yes, that is our plan, she replied. Kofi nodded. You need to go in there, day and night, nursing him back to life. I will make sure no one else goes in until he is ready to make you his queen. They shared a knowing laugh. Over the following days, the intricate dance of seduction began. Kofi prepped Adana on what to say and what to avoid, having studied the king's personality and preferences carefully. You need to be intelligent and a bit aloof, sexual but not forward, Kofi advised. If you can tow that line, we will be successful. Kofi was always diligently on the other side of the door, getting updates and giving recommendations on the next meeting. One day, after a particularly engaging discussion with the king about politics and the future of the kingdom, Kofi surmised that she was ready for stage 3, suggestion. You need to suggest that you can be a good queen in conversation with him, Kofi advised. 
the king likes a challenge. If he does not take the bait, at least the seed will have been planted. However, the queen mother is becoming suspicious of our plan, and as you know, she does not allow the king to see one concubine for an extended period of time. I cannot hold her off any longer. It has to be tonight. In the dimly lit corridor outside the king's chamber, Adana and Kofi huddled close, their voices low, and their expressions grave. The fate of their daring plan hung in the balance, and they were acutely aware of the perilous path they had chosen. Kofi's eyes bore a weight of concern as he spoke, his words laced with the gravity of the situation. Adana, he began, everything hinges on how well this interaction with the king goes tonight. Our dreams, our ambitions, they all depend on this moment. Adana nodded, her own anxiety palpable. I know, she replied softly. The queen mother has requested that today be the last day I tend to the king. Kofi's expression darkened, and he let out a heavy sigh. Adana felt a lump in her throat as she contemplated the daunting task ahead. Kofi placed a reassuring hand on her shoulder, his touch a lifeline in their sea of uncertainty. With a deep breath, Adana straightened her posture and squared her shoulders. I'm ready, she said resolutely, her eyes meeting Kofi's with unwavering resolve. Let's make this night count. Kofi nodded, his gaze filled with unwavering support. As she entered the king's chamber, her heart pounded in her chest, and she steeled herself for the daring intricate dance of seduction that lay ahead. To follow the story's progression, watch our story Concubine to Queen. Thank you for watching our story, The Eunuch and Concubine, and we hope you enjoyed it. What lessons did you draw from this story? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and be part of the tribe. Thank you for watching, The Tales of the Savannah. We will see you next time, in the Savannah.